Okay, welcome to Social Psychology Psych 230. Um, we're still on chapter one, where we're talking about basically uh, uh, theories and methods. We talked about descriptive methods last time. Okay, we talked about, you know, for instance, the observations, case studies, surveys, archival studies, and we talked about psychological tests as well. Today, we're gonna to talk about experimental methods, those methods that really help us explain what is going on, not just describe what's going on, but really help us explain. So we're gonna talk about experiments. So what is an experiment, okay? An experiment, it says, is a research method in which the researcher sets out to systematically manipulate one source of influence while holding others constant. Okay, that's a technical definition. So another way to say that is an experiment is basically a, a, um, a method in which you manipulate or vary some things while not letting other things change, okay? It's the only kind of method that gets at cause and effect. So let's talk about what, uh, what happens in an experiment. An experiment involves all these different things, okay? Has all these different features, okay? And I'm not gonna go over them in great detail, you should have learned this uh, about this in Psych 101, okay? So this is kind of review, okay? But you do have to know what an experiment is, okay? Very well, because remember, you have to do a paper or you have to critique a study. And if you know that it's an experiment, you need to know what an experiment contains to know if the experiment was done properly, okay? So experiments have what we call the independent variable. An independent variable or IV, I don't like the abbreviations. Maybe I should delete those because IV means different things because in the medical field, IV means intravenous, okay? But independent variable, IV, okay? The independent variable is basically that thing that you vary and you or that you manipulate. So if you're doing a study the invest, that investigates the effect or an experiment that, that looks at the effect of alcohol on aggression, the thing that you are varying is the amount of alcohol you give people. So alcohol, yes, no. Some people are gonna get alcohol, enough to intoxicate them, enough to get them drunk, and some people are not gonna get any alcohol. So the variable that you're varying is called the independent variable. Now, the one that you measure afterward, that's called the dependent variable or the DV, okay? That's the variable that's measured afterward. So if you're studying the effect of alcohol and aggression, the independent variable is alcohol, the thing you're measuring afterward, that's the aggression. That would be the dependent variable. If you're studying the effect of exercise on weight loss, then exercise is the independent variable. Weight loss is the dependent variable. If you wanna see if mood is affected by marijuana, marijuana is the independent variable, mood is the dependent variable. I said that one in reverse. It's not always the first thing you mention, okay? In a sentence, okay? The independent variable and the dependent variable isn't always the second thing. The one that's, be, that's varying is the independent variable. The one you're measuring afterward is the dependent variable. Experiments, uh, if they're to be done properly, should have a, uh, some kind of control group, okay? A control group is uh, technically a no treatment group. It's a group of people, a group of participants uh, that don't get any of the independent variable. So in our case, they don't get any alcohol. Just to continue with the example about the effect of alcohol and aggression. The control group are those that don't get anything. Okay, they get no alcohol. If you're studying the effect of exercise on weight loss, these are the people who don't get exercise. If you're studying the effect of uh, marijuana on mood, these are the people who will get no marijuana. They're the control group. Okay, we wanna see how people normally behave or their normal thought process, their normal mood. That's the control group. And then the experimental group is the treatment group. That is the group that is given a certain amount of the independent variable. That, those are the ones that get something. So in our example, this would be the individuals who get alcohol. These are the people that we intoxicate so that we see then what happens to their level of aggression, okay? And we're gonna compare the experimental group with the control group. If alcohol has an effect, the aggression of the experimental group should be higher than that of the control group, okay? So an experiment, if it's to be done properly, should have at least these four things, an independent and dependent variable. It should have a control group and an experimental group. But you'd be surprised how often you hear so-called experiments being described where there was no control group, All right? So you need at least these things. You could have more, okay? You could also have a placebo group and things like that, which is a type of control group, okay? Let's talk more about these experimental methods. Uh, so there's different types of experiments. There's two major types. 
Okay, there are laboratory experiments, which are the usual kind of experiments that you hear about. Okay, like when you hear about an experiment, right? It's usually a laboratory experiment, but there are other different uh, types of experiments. You could say more exotic kinds of experiments that are done outside in the real world. And those are called field experiments. And those are different. We'll talk about those as well. So let's talk about laboratory experiments first. And most of this should be reviewed. I mean, if you've heard about experiments, you heard about laboratory experiments. So laboratory experiments, uh, with laboratory experiments, uh, there is manipulation of an independent variable, or, or there could be more than one, but there's manipulation of an independent variable. So there's something you vary to see what it does to something else, okay? So there's manipulation of an independent variable, and then there's the measurement of the effects on a second uh, dependent variable, okay? That's just like the definition of an experiment, okay? But it's done in the laboratory, okay? So an example would be giving half of the participants alcohol and half the participants no alcohol in the lab, in the laboratory, okay? So there's an independent variable there. There's something that's varying, the amount of alcohol. So you give half the participants alcohol and the other half don't get any alcohol. And then you provoke them, you piss them off to determine if alcohol increases aggression. Those that are intoxicated, hopefully, will be more aggressive than those that are not. That is uh, a laboratory experiment. It's just an experiment that's done in the lab. We know about those already. What's interesting are the field experiments. Those are the different ones that maybe you haven't heard of, okay? But we'll talk about those in a moment. What are the advantages and disadvantages of laboratory experiments? First, the advantages. The advantage of a laboratory experiments is that it allows for you to have a cause and effect conclusion. In other words, it allows you to say, well, based on this experiment, we know that A causes B. We manipulate the amount of alcohol we gave participants, and we noted that those that received alcohol were more aggressive. So we have evidence that alcohol increases aggression or that alcohol causes aggression, right? That's the cause and effect conclusion. Another advantage of a laboratory experiment, an important one, uh, they're both important, those advantages, but another important one is that the control of extraneous variables. When you do an experiment in a laboratory, you can control those extraneous variables. In other words, you control the other things that happen. You're in a controlled environment. So you intoxicate people, some of them do not become intoxicated, and then you give them some opportunity to behave aggressively. You control other things. You make sure there are no distractions. You make sure that you know uh, some angry, maybe ex-girlfriend doesn't come by and piss them off even more, or somebody that they don't like. Uh, you know, you make sure that their cell phones are off and put away somewhere, things like that. There's potentially more distractions nowadays. Okay, you control those things. And it's important that you control the environment so that you can isolate the independent and dependent variable. That is the purpose. You want to make sure that A causes B, that the independent variable is leading to the changes in the dependent variable. And the way you do that is by isolating those variables. You control the other things. Let's talk about uh, disadvantages. Those are not the only advantages, but just some of the highlights, okay? Disadvantages, okay? Uh, what are some of the problems with uh, laboratory experiments? Well, laboratory experiments are done in the lab. So you have a very artificial situation right, that may not represent events as they naturally unfold. You have this situation, right, that seems like you're in the doctor's office or in the dentist's office, and you don't feel, as a participant, you don't feel normal in those circumstances, so you may not behave normally. That's a problem. This artificial situation can lead to, uh, you know, potentially getting a different result than would otherwise happen, okay? So subjects' responses may not be natural, since they are, they know they're being observed. They know they're in this experiment. They know they're, something's going to be happening to them. They've signed up for this study. They're coming into the laboratory and they don't feel normal. They may not behave naturally. There are ways around these disadvantages, all these disadvantages, by the way, there are ways to make participants feel more normal and behave more naturally. Okay. You can make the uh, laboratory just feel more real. Okay. If you're studying children, for instance, and you're doing some kind of experiment with children, you can make the laboratory look like a little play area with toys and a little rug, right? Um, you can make your, uh, you know, the, that room where your 
participants are drinking, make it feel like a, uh, you know, like a bar or something like that, or like a nightclub, you know, and you can make it more real. Okay, so there are ways around disadvantages. There's always ways to alleviate these, but these are some of the disadvantages. Okay, um, let's talk about field experiments. Field experiments are different. These are experiments that are done in the natural world. So a field experiment is when you have a manipulation of an independent variable using unknowing participants in a natural setting, okay? So what happens is there's people out there going about their business, right, in the natural world, and they are unknowingly uh, subjected to an experiment. They unknowingly participate in an experiment. That might sound like it's difficult to do, like it's tricky, right? It, it does take some more planning. Um, but here's an example, okay? Here's an example, not a good example, but one just to make the point very clearly, right? You go to a bar, okay, where participants are already drinking on their own, okay? Already doing what they normally do. So you go to a bar and you provoke those people who are drinking, you piss them off, right? To see what happens, to see if they become aggressive. And you also provoke, you piss off those that are not drinking and see how aggressive they become. This is to determine if alcohol increases aggression, right? They're there drinking, minding their own business, and then they're unknowingly being manipulated, being made to behave a certain way or to think a certain way. Now, I know that sounds dangerous, right? And it is, right? This is just an example. That's normally not the way these field experiments are done, but it's just to give you a clear example. Another example, which is one that's based on an actual study, is the swinging bridge study. And if you can see the image there, right? You have two guys there on a swinging bridge. So the swinging bridge, a swinging bridge study, uh, is a study that was done uh, to learn more about emotions, or actually learn more specifically about attraction. And uh, there's this swinging bridge out there in the natural world that you know this bridge made of rope and wood planks. It's really high up. You walk over it. It moves. You think you're gonna fall. It's scary. Okay. Participants are going over this bridge like they normally do, okay? And then what happens to is they are, ex, you know, subjected to something. They're, well, they're subjecting themselves to something, but you do a study in this naturalist setting. Let me explain this, okay? So some participants are crossing this swinging bridge that is scary, okay? It's really high up. It, it, it moves a lot. It shakes. It feels like you're going to fall. And then they cross, and then on the other side, there is this attractive female experimenter waiting for them. And she wants to uh, ask them some questions. Uh, she asked them questions like, you know, how did you feel when you, you know, oh, that, you know, that, uh, you know, we want, uh, we want some information from you about what you think. Uh, wh what did it feel like going across that bridge? You know, how did you feel? Things like that. Um, so basically you have just participated in a study and we want your opinion. And she also tells them, um, you know, she asked them, would you like my phone number so I can give you, with, give you more details about the study? I can't really tell you too much now, you know, but would you like my phone number so I can call you and we can talk some more about this stuff? And of course the female experimenter uh, notes how many people want her phone number? She's an attractive female experimenter, okay? There's another situation happening in another, uh, in another setting where participants are walking across a normal, sturdy steel and concrete bridge, one that isn't scary. And they're walking across that, that bridge. And on the other side is also an attractive female experimenter. And by the way, it might be the same one. It's just that maybe it's done on a different day. Maybe she's at different locations on different days, okay? It'd be best if it's the same person, okay? To make sure it's, uh, you know, it's very controlled, okay? So there's an attractive female experimenter on the other side. And she basically tells him, oh, hey, you just participated in a study. We'd like to know your opinion. How did you feel when you walked across that bridge, right? Would you like my phone number so we can talk some more about this so I can provide you with more details? She notes how many people ask her for her phone number. It's a study on attraction, on the effect of arousal on attraction. 
The swinging bridge is one that is going to increase arousal, heart rate, blood pressure will go up because it's scary. And they wanna see if that kind of feeds into the attraction for the female experiment or the attractive female experimenter. If more people ask her for the phone number after they've crossed that bridge, then those that cross the other bridge, the sturdy steel bridge. And by the way, it's only men, okay, who they're interested in. It's only men who are participants in these studies, okay? You could have women attracted to women, but just to make it uh, so they have a, you know, greater odds of attraction, they, you know, they ask men. Most people are heterosexual, okay? So it's only with men. And it's a study of attraction. And the, and the study showed basically that, uh, that, yes, physiological arousal will intensify feelings of attraction. More men that cross the swinging bridge Ask for the participants for the for not for the participants for the female experimenter's phone number uh, than those that cross the sturdy steel bridge. That's what the study suggests. And there's a very important lesson there, right? If you're on a date and you want things to go well, let's say let's say the person already has some attraction to you because they have agreed to go out with you, right? If you want to increase your chances of a second date, take them somewhere exciting. Something that's going to get the blood flowing, that's likely to intensify feelings of attraction. That's what the study suggests. I would love to hear your comments on this, but we have to wait. Okay, so that's another example of a field experiment, one that was actually done, an actual study. It's not called the swinging bridge experiment, but that's just a way to describe it, okay? Um, let's talk about advantages and disadvantages of these field experiments. experiments. The advantages are you know, well, you have a, you know, it allows for a cause and effect conclusion again. You do have an independent variable. In this case, they're varying the amount of arousal in the, uh, with the swinging bridge study, right? They're going to see how the arousal increases attraction, right? You have a dependent variable that they're measuring afterward attraction via the asking for the phone number or wanting the phone number. So yes, you still have cause and effect conclusions. And because it's done in the real world, in the natural world, subjects give more natural responses. People behave the way they normally do, okay? There are disadvantages of these field experiments. Although participants don't know they are being observed, often they don't know they're being observed until the end when you want them to fill something out or you ask them some questions. They don't know that they're participating in anything. The situation is very unusual for them. You just cross this bridge and all of a sudden you want, there's this person who wants to talk to you about it. Like what the heck's going on, you know? And some people are surprised by like, what the heck? You know, it's like, what, you wanna to talk to me? And it takes them uh, by surprise. And then therefore they, they may not behave naturally. It's unusual. Just imagine, right? If you, if you go to a bar, you do a field, a field experiment like that where you go and you just piss people off who are drunk or people who are not drunk. And people are there, but like, what the hell's your problem? It just seems very unusual. Okay, and therefore participants not behave naturally because you're not really behaving naturally as the one who's, you know, trying to, you know, get some answers from them. Um, a big uh, disadvantage here, an important one to note is that there's less control of extraneous factors than in laboratory experiments. In laboratory experiments, everything is tightly controlled. The temperature, right? We minimize distraction, make sure there's no distractions. Everything happens in a certain way. In a field experiment, things can go wrong more easily, okay? They can get distracted, uh, they can ignore you. Uh, lots of things can go wrong. Just look at the picture. Let's go back to the picture over here. Look at the picture and these, where the, you know, the swinging bridge there. That guy's crossing, these two guys are crossing the swinging bridge together. That's not a good thing. We want them one by one. They're crossing it together. And one of them is basically uh, looking down and not even paying attention. There's a lot of things that can go wrong. And because there's a lot of things that you do not control out in the natural world. And when there's things that you cannot control, what that does, the important thing here is that it weakens uh, that cause and effect conclusion. It may be that yes, the arousal really led to the increased attraction that we saw, or it may be that something else got in the way. And that's why we see the results that we do. You have less control. So therefore your cause and effect conclusion is not as strong as in a laboratory experiment. You gain, with a field experiment, you gain uh, basically uh, what's called external validity. You gain more 
you know, it's more realistic, right? You gain that, but you lose control and therefore weaken the cause and effect conclusion. There's a trade-off. All right, let's keep going. So those are experiments, okay? There's descriptive methods and then there's, ex there's experimental methods. We just talked about the experiment. Now we're gonna talk about something uh, that relates to all of these where we need to talk about validity. Some of these apply more to experiments than, uh, than others, um, but you need to know about these things, right? Uh, and be able to think about these uh, methods correctly. So first thing we need to talk, talk about is validity, right? Is the, um, is the experiment valid or is the study valid? Does it really say what we think it says, okay? There's something known as internal validity. It says for experiment, it's the extent to which an experiment allows confident statements about cause and effect. Let me explain that, okay? Internal validity basically means that you are pretty sure that your independent variable really did cause changes in the dependent variable. That's internal validity. That's cause and effect. You are pretty sure about that. that you have internal validity. An example, okay, does broccoli really cause an increase in your lifespan? Okay, um, here's the thing. If you do an experiment, you'll probably find out that eating broccoli isn't going to increase your lifespan. And how would you do this experiment, right? You have to, you know, experiments are done in one point in time usually, right? You're not gonna, it's not gonna take, you know, 40, 50 years or whatever it is, however long somebody's lifespan is. So this, this uh, study was more likely done uh, in some other way. It might've been uh, archival research or something like that where they note people's diets and, and then they note how long they lived, something like that. Um, but this, this probably doesn't have good internal validity, right? Broccoli causes an increase in your lifespan? Uh, probably not because it doesn't, that statement there doesn't really refer to a carefully done experiment. So if you want to know if something has internal validity, what you really have to know is does the independent variable really cause changes in the dependent variable? Or is that questionable? Things like that. Or uh, there's studies that, for instance, that show that, uh, for instance, that uh, those that eat cereal uh, don't weigh that much, that, that those that eat cereal basically weigh less. Do you have internal validity with that study? Do you have good internal validity? Does that mean that cereal causes a decrease in weight? No, that doesn't have good internal validity. That study was more likely done uh, with a survey. And, uh, and what you have there is that, what you'll find is that those that eat cereal are more likely to be children. Adults are less likely to eat cereal and adults weigh more. Cereals are usually very sugary, not very good for you. Not gonna help you lose weight. But when you do a, a study that's not really done like a true experiment, you have a survey or something else, and they're trying to claim cause and effect that you can question the internal validity and you say that, no, we have a problem here with internal validity, right? This thing doesn't really cause this other thing. That's internal validity. It's a little bit hard to understand, which is why I'm trying to explain it a lot, but it really means that whether if you have, what it really means is that you can be certain that the independent variable really cause changes in the dependent variable, that you really have a good cause and effect conclusion. And this usually applies to experiments, okay? But when you have other studies that are claiming cause and effect and they're not experiments, you can say that there's a lack of internal validity here. This is not an experiment. There's not even, we don't even have an independent variable, anything that was varied, okay? You can't talk about cause and effect. Um, another type of validity is called external validity. External validity is the extent to which the results of an experiment or actually any study can be generalized to other circumstances or other people. External validity means that basically you can take your results from the limited group of people that you used in the study and you can apply them to others. So does, does the experiment, does the aggression experiment say something about aggression in the real world? So we did an, an experiment that showed that alcohol increases aggression. We did that in the lab, okay? And we found that alcohol increases aggression, okay? Does that mean that alcohol increases aggression in the real world? If it does, then that means you have external validity. Or does this experiment only tell us that yes, alcohol increases aggression, but only in this kind of setting. 
So in other words, we can't really generalize. It's harder to generalize laboratory experiments because they're done in an artificial setting. Whereas with a field experiment, it's easy to generalize. And that's external validity, okay? External validity means that your results apply to the real world. If you study, let's say 100 depressed people, you wanna be able to generalize. You wanna say that from these 100 depressed people, I know what depressed people are like out there. That means you have external validity. External validity and generalization are the same thing. You can generalize. That means the, it, that your study is valid out there in the real world. You have to keep coming back to internal external validity. As a matter of fact, to tell you a little bit more about your paper, you're gonna to have to find, find flaws in the study, in the research that was done, point out the flaws and tell me, does it affect internal validity or external validity and why? But we'll see examples later on. So if you're not sure now, don't worry. Okay, we'll talk about more about this assignment later, but I'm just pointing it out as we go along. Um, other things that affect validity, validity would be uh, operationalization. Big long word, sounds fancy. Operationalization, is basically when you define a variable in such a way that allows you to study it and measure it scientifically. Let me say that again, operationalization is when you define something in such a way that allows you to measure it, okay? So if we wanna do a study that determines uh, whether alcohol increases aggression, we have to operationalize our variables. So the effect of alcohol on aggression, we have alcohol and aggression, okay? So first aggression, how do we operationalize aggression? Aggression can be many different things, okay? It could be any behavior that is intended to hurt someone. That's the definition of aggression. But what can we measure? Can we measure, right? Like these things like slaps, punches, kicks, right? Electric shocks, there are many ways to behave aggressively, okay? We have to define aggression in such a way that we can measure it. Can measure the number of slaps, the number of punches, the number of kicks, or maybe the extent to which people shock each other. Some of those are easier than others. It is hard to operationalize aggression. It used to be easier in the past. In the past, um, participants were allowed to hurt each other. Now we know that that's unethical and that's not allowed anymore, okay? You can't really hurt each other anymore. So what do we do, right? Well, you have to think of another way to operationalize aggression. Uh, let me tell you more about the past. In the past, uh, researchers, researchers were allowed to use electric shock. Participants were allowed to shock each other, right? Hooked up to wires, electrodes. And when somebody said something mean to you or did something you didn't like, you can shock them and hurt them. Physically shock them and actually hurt them. They used to allow that. I've read about that research. I didn't do that research, but I've read about it. That's not allowed anymore. Participants cannot be harmed in any way. So what do you do now? You know what? You can still use electric shock, but it's not real. So what you do is basically you, um, you make participants believe that they are shocking each other, that they press this button and they shock the other person and hurt the other person. But in reality, the other person is not getting shocked. So there are ways around, ways around this problem. You have to make people believe that they are actually hurting someone, okay? But you're, you can't allow them to hurt each other. So it's a little bit tricky. You have to operationalize or define aggression in a way that allows you to actually measure it, okay? Now, how do, so the effect of alcohol and aggression. So what about alcohol? How do we operationalize intoxication? We want some people to be drunk and some not to be drunk. How do we operationalize that? That one is easy, okay? Blood alcohol level, BAC of 0.08 or greater. We know that's the legal definition of being legally drunk. And there's an instrument for that called the breathalyzer that can be used, which I actually used in my own studies to determine how drunk people are, whether they are legally intoxicated or not. Because we gave them alcohol. We, we gave, made them, and we measured the amount of intoxication. And we gave them opportunities to behave aggressively without really hurting anyone. So it's a bit tricky, but you have to, you have, to have a way of measuring, no, of, of defining something so that you can measure it. That's the tricky thing. That's called oper operationalization. I'm telling you this because you need to think about that. When you read about these studies, right? The one you wanna critique and they're talking about happiness. You have to ask yourself, 
how do they define happiness? Is this really happiness? Is this the correct way to measure happiness or is this questionable? How are they defining, you know, uh, depression or whatever it is? Some things are easier to define than others, some are not. If you see things that they're talking about happiness, they're talking about quality of life, what the heck is that? How do you measure that? You have to question those things. I'm not saying they didn't do it right, but you have to think about these things. You have to think about how they operationalize variables. And that applies to all studies, whether it's a survey or an experiment. You have to think about random assignment as well. In experiments, it's a good thing to use random assignment. When you use random assignment in an experiment, that means you assign subjects or participants to treatment so that each subject has an equal chance of being in any condition. So if you have an experiment where half the participants are gonna be intoxicated and half of them are gonna be sober, you have to randomly assign people to those conditions. You can't just decide that you know someone's gonna be drunk and the other people and this one's gonna be sober. You, you're gonna be drunk. You, you're gonna be sober. You don't do it that way. That's kind of biased. Okay. You have to do it randomly. So you kind of flip a coin. Heads, they're gonna be in the alcohol condition, tails in the no alcohol condition. And you do that and say, all right, first person comes in, okay, you, you know, tails, okay, you're gonna be in the alcohol condition. You don't really tell them that, but they get exposed to they get real alcohol. The next person they get a tails, they get no alcohol. And it's not really done with the flip of a coin or rolling of the dice, right? It's really a computer that a computer program that generates uh, basically the 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 it generates the the pattern you have to follow. That the first person that comes in is going to be in this condition, the second one in this one, and it also breaks it up by uh, you know by sex. So if it's a male, it's going to be in this one first. Second male is going to be in this one. If it's female, this one. If we have someone who's white, someone who's black, and it breaks it up so that. You have random assignment also according to uh, not just conditions, but also to all these different things, okay? So here's an example. In an alcohol study, you need to randomly assign all participants to condition, do it randomly, okay? So that all the males don't end up in the alcohol condition and all the females in the no alcohol condition. If you have more males in the alcohol condition, you are guaranteeing yourself that, yes, that alcohol will increase aggression because males are naturally more aggressive than females. That's a biased way of assigning participants. But in reality, you, like I said, you don't do it with the flip of a coin. You do it with a random table that's generated by a computer program. And you follow it and it ensures that everything is split up evenly. And you don't end up with too many males here or there or more black people over here or more white people over here. You make sure everything's evenly split. Everything is kind of randomized and uh, and the chances of being in one condition versus the other should be more or less equal. And you should end up with close to equal numbers for each group. Another potential problem with an experiment is a compound. You could have a, com a compound. A compound is a variable that changes along with the independent variable, leading to the mistaken con conclusion concerning its effect and threatens internal validity. Uh, let me explain that because this can be a little bit harder to understand, but hopefully yeah, you heard a little bit about this from Psych 101. A compound is just some extra thing that basically is messing up your experiment. So you want, you're doing an experiment that, to see if alcohol increases aggression. So you wanna isolate the, you know, the independent variable, the alcohol and aggression, and when you wanna control the other things, right? But maybe there's something else that comes up that uh, affects the, uh, the experiment. Like maybe in a certain day that you're running the experiment, uh, it's a very hot day and the AC isn't working. And there you are trying to run your alcohol, exp your experiment and participants are frustrated and therefore behaving more aggressively, not because they're intoxicated, but because the room is really hot and you didn't intend for that to happen. And that's something that happened. That's a compound. That's something else that is changing in your experiment along with the independent variable and is affecting your conclusion. Another example, uh, one that's uh, easy to understand. So you know what we're talking about with a compound. So, you know, due to lack of random assignment, all males are in the alcohol condition and all females in the no condition. Thus alcohol is confounded with gender or confounded with sex, technically sex, if we're talking about just males and females. Um, so here's the thing, what if you, uh, you, know, you do your experiment and you just end up with more males in the alcohol condition 
or more males and, and, and more females in the no alcohol condition. You have a compound. Your study shows that alcohol increases aggression, but there's a compound because there's more males in the alcohol condition. What your study is really showing is that males are more aggressive, okay? Because there's more males in the alcohol condition. Because you don't have males and females evenly split up, the difference of having more males in one condition versus the other could be what's explaining your results. That's called a compound. Compounds come in many different forms, but it's an example. You have to think about those things. When you read about an experiment, is there something else that could be leading to these results? Is there a potential compound? You have to understand what that is, okay? Or if the, uh, if the study is claiming cause and effect, maybe it's not an experiment, but they're claiming cause and effect. And you can say, well, you know, this is not really what's happening there here. What's really explaining the results is this. It's this other thing. It's this compound. There are many things you can say, but you need to know what you're dealing with, whether it's an experiment or a survey, so that you can know uh, what some of the inherent flaws are, or if the, uh, if the study is not being described, described correctly. It's a survey, but they're describing the results as if it's an experiment. So you can point out those flaws. More about validity, there's also uh, potential demand characteristics. Demand characteristics are cues that make participants or subjects aware of how the experimenter expects them to behave. It threatens external validity. So let me explain this, okay? Let me say this another way. Demand characteristics are things in the study, in the experiment, that basically tell participants how they should behave. And therefore, they behave that way and they don't behave naturally. It's something about the study that basically tells participants, hey, act this way. And therefore, you know, they don't behave naturally. So you can't really say that this is really what happens out there because participants were made to behave in a certain way. Like, let, let me give you an example. Let's say you do a study to determine if, for instance, if, uh, if the amount of lighting in a room uh, increases happiness. So, uh, you know, participants come in, do your, you know, your experiment and say, oh, you know, well, we're gonna, you know, we're studying to see uh, whether lighting, uh, you know, uh, increases your happiness. And so some participants are exposed to a lot of light and some participants are exposed to low light. And then your study shows that those in the low light condition um, are, uh, are happier. Well, I mean, you have a demand characteristic there. You told them you were studying happiness. So participants are telling you, yeah, I'm happy. You're telling me the study is about happiness, so I'm telling you I'm happy. Or let's say participants find out that, uh, let's say you're doing a survey and your survey is about racism. And because of your questions, participants find out that you're interested in racism and they don't wanna seem racist. So they say they're not racist. That's a problem with demand as well. They're telling you, hey, I'm not racist because they know what you're getting at and they don't wanna tell you that, that's demand. So in an experiment, for instance, participants know they are being observed and therefore they act unnatural. They behave the way they normally wouldn't. Or maybe they act contrary, They're, they act in the opposite way or maybe in, agree, in an agreeable way. Maybe you tell them it's about, they find out the studies about happiness, so they act more happy. Or maybe they find out the studies about aggression, so they behave non-aggressively because they don't wanna seem aggressive. They would be acting contrary in that case. So the example here, participants become aware or somehow they get clues that the experiment is about aggression and therefore they hold back and they don't behave aggressively. I had problems like that when I was running my, uh, my research. Now you run participants one at a time. There were some that were able to figure out, you know, hey, you're messing me with me. I know what you're trying to do. You're trying to piss me off, right? And they basically figured it out and therefore it didn't work. And therefore I had to exclude their data uh, from the other data to make sure that my results are still valid. There was this one time, there was this big football player that I had to piss off. He basically, he was on the team, on the USC football team. I was a bit concerned, damn, I'm gonna piss off this guy. He's gonna, he's gonna kill me, right? Because I was running a study on uh, alcohol and aggression. You know, and, and I believe that he, you know, got some alcohol and now I have to piss him off and see if he behaves aggressively and measure that, right? And I was concerned. Uh, luckily for me in that case, uh, he kind of knew what I was getting at and he didn't behave aggressively. He, 
I, not that he, he shouldn't beat me up or anything like that, but what I'm saying is he didn't behave aggressively. He knew the experiment was about aggression and it wasn't my fault. I did it really well. The problem is his girlfriend had participated like hours before and she told him. So therefore he didn't behave naturally. So I had to discard his data. But when participants kind of figure out what the experiment's about or they figure out what you're getting at, you know, they could give you what you're looking for. They could give you the opposite, but basically you're, they're not gonna behave naturally. And that's gonna affect the external validity, your ability to generalize. More about validity, more about demand characteristics. Because of demand characteristics, because participants will often not behave naturally, or they won't behave naturally when they know what you're trying to study. Because of that, psychologists, especially social psychologists, will often use what are called deceptive techniques. They'll use, they'll basically lie to participants or omit information so that they behave naturally. So the experiment, for instance, is presented as a competitive game. It's a game of competition. That's what we're studying. We're studying competition, okay? It's not presented as an, as, as an experiment on, on aggressive behavior because if we presented it that way, then it wouldn't work. No one wants to be seen as aggressive. Or if you're doing a survey and let's say you do not disguise the purpose of your survey and your survey is about racism, it's not gonna work. It's not, the results won't really be valid because people don't wanna say that they're racist or that they're prejudiced. But this particularly, this, these things generally apply to experiments, that's what we're talking about, but you can also think of them as applying to those other studies, okay? If you know how to think about it correctly. You have to think about these things and ask yourself, what's going on here? What's the potential flaw in this study? Why is it a flaw? Does it affect the internal or external validity? But yes, we have to use deceptive techniques, not all the time. There are some things you can study where you can just tell people the truth. You know, uh, there are people who study uh, vision, for instance, and they can tell them, yeah, we're interested in your vision. We're gonna see, you know, how, how well it works in these circumstances. Um, and uh, the fact that you tell them it's about vision is not going to affect the study because vision is gonna work however it works, no matter what they think. But when you're doing sensitive experiments that are about aggression, they're about racism, uh, about prejudice or whatever it is, some sensitive topic where you know participants are just not gonna wanna be truthful if they know what it's really about, then you have to create what's called a cover story. You have to create a story for the experiment that leads them to believe that you're interested in something else. You're interested in helping, not aggression, or you're interested in competition or something else so that you can basically get at their real uh, behavior or their real thoughts or feelings. And that's it. Let me stop recording.